Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephen. I'm a traditionally published fantasy author. Today I'm answering your questions about a literary agent. I posted this question on a community tab asking people if there are any questions about what a literary agent does, what you know, how you work with them, what relationships like, what does it mean, how does it work day to day, and people posted a bunch of questions which I'm going to answer now. The first question was around social media, and it was do agents care about your social media, how many followers you have, what kind of a presence you have on social media, and in general the answer is no, they don't care about any of that thing. I've previously done two videos about myths around traditional publishing, I'll put links down below so you can check them out. But the short answer is, if you have one follower on Twitter, or 10,000, or 100,000, it doesn't really matter when you approach them with your book. Later on, it might be important. However, if you go in and you say, here's my book, it's really, really brilliant, it's about, I don't know, goats, and then they look at the book and think it's horrific, and you've got 100,000 followers, they're not going to pick you up, because the work is what matter. the matters. They have to have something they can sell, and if it's just awful, it doesn't matter that you've got 100,000 followers. If you have a brilliant book, then it's useful for promotion if you have a large following. But the other thing that people forget is that the numbers don't translate. If you have a million subscribers, a million followers, whatever it might be, on every video and every post, everything that you article, you ever put out, do you get a million likes, a million, a million comments, a million anything? You don't. You get a small percentage. Like anything else, it reduces, it goes down and down and down. So any YouTube video, any tweet, any Facebook post, anything, TikTok, whatever it might be, you never get the full subscription. Some people follow you just because, some people just think, oh, that's quite interesting, they follow you for a while, then you forget, and they just leave you on their list, and your number of followers can increase, and you just don't have the full kind of transfer of the numbers translating to sales. So it isn't necessary to have a massive social media presence in order to get a literary agent. The next question was, what does a literary agent do once the contract is signed? So, in the other video again, I have talked about this, but I'll expand on it a little bit here. One of the things my agent does, and this is not unique to her, is she sells the international rights for my books. So, my first trilogy was with Orbit Books. Um, Orbit bought the English language rights, which means they can publish the first three books in English anywhere in the world. That's what they're allowed to do as part of the contract. However, my agent then sold that first trilogy to international publishers who published fantasy. So there are two main events in the calendar. There's the London Book Fair, which in 2022, at time of recording, will be in April, and there's the Frankfurt Book Fair in Germany, which is going to be in uh, October this year. And at those events, but also throughout the year, my agent will contact uh, agencies and publishers in other countries and say, hello, this book's just come out, it's about, it's a fantasy book about this, that and the other, it's really good, it's sold this many copies, it's a bit like X and Y that previously you've looked at, Would you know, do you want to buy the French rights, the German rights for each of the countries they will approach who have an interest in fantasy? That's the other thing to say. If, like me, you publish fantasy and let's just say in, I don't know, in Portugal, there isn't a market for fantasy. Actually, there is, but let's let's just pretend there isn't. And she goes, "Hey, there's a great fantasy book. Do you want to buy it?" Then be like, "Well, well, no, we don't. We've tried to do it in the past. It hasn't really worked. So it's not it's not for us. We're not going to take it. Thanks." So she won't approach them. So she has to know the market. She has to know what people are into. She has to follow the trends of all of these publishers in all of the countries and see what's really selling in this country. What's really popular. That's one of the things they do. Some of the others are covered in the previous video. The next question was related to this and said, "Do does your agent pitch the movie adaptations and the audiobooks and so on? So when you signed a contract, typically when you're traditionally published, the publisher will buy in English language rights, they will buy paperback, hardback if you have hardback, ebook and audiobook. The publisher will do all of that. You don't pay the publisher for any of this. As I always say with traditional publishing, the money flows from other people to the author. I never paid my agent until the contract was signed. I got money from the publisher. I didn't pay the publisher for anything. They took care of the ebooks, the audiobook, getting hiring someone, paying them, spending all the time putting it on, you know, Audible and everywhere else. They do all of that. So your your publisher deals with all of that. Movie rights are something completely different. You hold on to those rights, and if someone is interested in adapting your material, 
you direct them to your literary agent and they will then negotiate and talk to that person. However, some literary agents do not deal in the film rights. There are separate literary agents that are exclusive for book and comic rights to film adaptations and TV adaptations. They deal with the kind of the media side of that. So they don't go around pitching your book to people. People will approach the author or the agent directly and say, are the rights available? Can we option them? And an option is where production company or someone will buy the rights for a period of time. Typically, it's about two years. They pay a nominal fee. Let's just say it's $10,000. They pay you, the author, $10,000 and say, right, we now have the movie and TV rights to your book for the next two years. We have to do something within those two years to make it into a show. If we don't, the rights come back to you, you still keep the money, and we walk away. And this happens many, many times. Several of my author friends have had their books optioned. Nothing ever happened. They never got made into TV shows or films or anything, and they just got paid a chunk of money. And some people keep re-upping the kind of option so that someone else can't buy it. This happens a lot for very popular IP. Look at the number of fantasy books that have been adapted now into TV shows. And sometimes people just buy the IP so that someone else can't in the hope that something might come up and they can sell it on to someone and then make a TV show or something of it. So that's something else your agent could get involved with or if you have a special agent that works just exclusively looking at adaptation rights. The next few questions I had were about the client and author relationship and they're sort of related. Some people were saying, how should they foster strong bond with their agent and is this important? And someone else was saying, is there an industry standard? They've seen that some agents are very, very close with their authors and some say they only speak to them every now and then. And the next question was, how often do you speak to your, your agent? Is it something you should do every day, every week? How, you know, how does it work? So I'll tell you about my relationship with my agent and how it works with me. So to begin with, when you first send out your book and an agent says, yes, I want to represent you and, you know, you then will typically go and meet them if you can, because sometimes they might not be in the same country, but you'd have a conversation for sure, whether it's over the phone or these days, you know, Zoom or Skype or whatever it might be, and you'd have a conversation with them. Because they're going to be your champion for your book. Now, if they read the book and they love it, and then when they have that first conversation with you to talk it through, you're rude and abrasive and really, you know, awful and unpleasant to them, they're probably going to walk away because in theory this is someone that you're going to be working with for any number of years over any number of projects and if you're constantly just you know shouting at them and cutting them off they're not the kind of person that they would want to work with why would you want to work with that if you get a job in any business you know you walk into the office you sit down you meet the people around you and you get on with your work. You don't have any choice whatsoever with all of the people sat around you. You can't say, no, no, I don't want to work with this person and that person. This it's not, doesn't come into you. You don't, you don't get to decide. This is kind of a unique thing. You to get to decide the kind of agent that you want to work with and vice versa, the kind of clients that they want to take on. Now, that's not to say that when you go in and meet with the agent or talk to them over the phone that first time and they say, oh, I love your book. It was really good, but I want to take it off this way now and instead of it being kind of fairly politically neutral I want to make it really kind of go over here and we're going to talk about all these important issues and you were kind of down the middle I want to do this and make your book all about that there again that's kind of a red flag that means that there's something wrong that means that they've got an agenda they want to change your book into something and at that point it would be up to you to say no thanks this isn't a good fit you want someone that will champion your work that will love your work, that will see the vision that you're going for with the book and they will understand it. Now, when I worked on my first book and all my subsequent books, my agent gave her feedback on them and we talked them through. Some things that she raised, I conceded and said, actually, yes, I can see your point. That makes a lot more sense for the story, for the character, for the world building, that's good. And then the other points she might have raised, and I've gone, actually, I'm pushing back on that and these are the reasons why. So there's some negotiation. I didn't just sit back and go, yep, fine, whatever you say, just so that I'll get you, take me on as your client, and then we'll get the book out and it'll be brilliant. That's, that's not how it works. It's a very kind of back and forth, it's discussion, and that's really important. You want someone who is like that. As to the kind of relationship, well, as I've just talked about, you want someone 
that you can get on with on a, on to some degree on a personal level who at least has the same sort of feeling for your books now that's not to say the person has to have the same interests and hobbies and you ring them up all the time and you email them like, oh, I just saw this really funny, funny thing on YouTube or oh, I've heard a brilliant new song and they send it to them. You know, some agents have that kind of relationship with their clients. Some don't. Some are completely professional. Some treat it just as like a kind of business to business relationship, which is what it is. It's totally different. It's totally unique. There isn't an industry standard. And people think, should you foster a good relationship with your agent? Well, you should try and have a good one, if at all possible, because you want them to be on good terms with you. You want them to love your book and to think about it and to try and sell it and to go out there and promote it. That's not to say that you have to be constantly sending them gifts, because remember, it's the agent's best interest to sell your book as far and as wide as they can, because they only make money when you make money. So on that first book deal that you get, like I had my first book deal with Orbit, that first trilogy, great, I got paid, she got a percentage of that, that's how it works. Then, of course, she went out and sold it to France, Germany, Russia, that first trilogy. You know, she's working hard, she's getting out there, she's promoting it to these other countries, it's then been published in these other territories, and she gets some money from that. So every time there's a book deal you see announced, every time you see so-and-so's just had their their Polish translation rights have just been sold, or Hungarian, or German, or whatever it might be. Every time that happens, you get paid, you get a bigger audience, your agent gets paid. So it's in their best interest for your books to do well. Related to this, but also going back to the question about how often do you contact your agent and what do they do after the book has been signed, this is something else that has happened in the past, where say you've got your book and it's gone to the publisher, and your editor starts working on it, and you get some notes back from your editor that you don't agree with, that you're struggling with, that you can't kind of get your head around. I might ring my agent up and say, look, she's already read the book, she knows what it's about, and I've had this note, and I don't understand it, or I'm not comfortable with it. I could approach the editor direct, or if it's something more complicated, I could talk to my agent first, use her as a sounding board, get her to read the notes, see if she can get under it and work out what it actually means if I'm struggling with it. So I have that kind of relationship with my agent. She's happy for me to do that. Some people will just go straight to the editor and say, what do you mean? And work it out with them. It really depends on what the note is, how big a change they're making to the book, if it's just something small and detailed. So there's, you know, there's back and forth again with your editor. They might make a recommendation and you can say, no thanks, these are the reasons why. And they, find, they say, okay, that's fine, and you go with it. It's just if you run into any kind of problems or any serious issues, your agent is always your first port of call. They're your champion. They're your person that, you know, signed you because they love your books. They're the ones that I would, you know, the person I would talk to initially. Another reason you might contact your agent is if you get any requests for anything. I saw you did this fantasy book. Would you be interested in writing some content for our IP, which I've had a couple of times they've come up, and I've said, okay, Go and talk to my agent, talk to her about, you know, the what kind of rate you're offering, what's the deal, what's the contract, how long does it last, all this kind of stuff. She's done the negotiating on the business side. Being a traditionally published author in some ways is a bit like being, you know, some celebrities that you see, they never actually handle real money, they don't understand real money. It's a little bit like that in that anything that comes to the money or the contracts, I push it to my agent and say, you know, that's her expertise, that's her specialty, she knows what she's doing. And I don't touch the money until later on anyway, when they say they want to pay me some money for doing the work. The next question was about book deals, saying, let's say you're signed up for a two book deal. Obviously your agent has read the first one and then the editor takes it on and they love it. It's a complete book. And then you start editing it. The question was, you know, how involved is your editor and your agent in determining the plot of the second book? Okay, so there's two, two different ways to look at it. If you signed up for a duology or a trilogy, say, what typically happens is obviously you've handed in the first full book to the uh, publisher. Your editor has said, all right, you know, this is brilliant. I love it. What they did in my case would say, OK, this is a trilogy. I want some notes on book two and some notes on book three. And I think I supplied something like two or three pages on book two and maybe, you know, half a page on book three. So they have an idea of where the book is going, where the series is going as a whole just so they understand but to begin with the initial focus was all on that first book 
editing it, revising it, making it as good as possible because it's going to be my debut so that everyone will just really, you know, knuckle down and make it brilliant. And once that gets to a certain stage, your editor will then come back to you and say, right, how are you getting on with the first draft of book two? What's going on with it? They do not determine the plot of that book or the rest of the trilogy. You do. You're the author. Your agent doesn't determine that either. It's completely on you. If it was not a series, if you had two standalone books, let's say you write you know, literary fiction and you've done like a, a book about someone which is witnessing a murder across the street, the girl in the girl on the train or something like that, you know, that's a book, it's self-contained, start and stop, but you've signed for a two book deal. What they sometimes will say is, so-and-so has been signed up for a two book deal, the girl on the train and another you know, untitled book at this time. Now it might be that you've given them an idea and you've given them some notes or based upon the strength of that first book that was so good and you've pitched them a bunch of various ideas they're like oh all of us are brilliant yeah we'll take you on for two books you may have only given them a few notes on it. There again when you come to write that second book they don't determine the plot it's all on you. They might give you notes once you've finished the book they will give you feedback as part of the editing process but they don't steer the ship. It's your book, it's your creation. It's not up to them. The next question was about contract negotiation. What does your agent do? How do you know what they've changed? What is the publisher offering? How far can they go? All of this sort of stuff. People are asking questions about this. So I'll tell you how it works with me. And this is a very similar story I've heard from other friends who are traditionally published authors. What happens is you get an offer from the publisher for your first you know, book, trilogy, whatever it might be, and you'll get a copy of that contract and you will see it. Now, unless you're a lawyer or you're a legal expert, you won't understand all of it. Now, I know that some traditionally published authors have then hired a lawyer or a legal person to read the document for them, study it, and pull out anything that's concerned to them. My, I did not hire a legal agent or a legal person of any kind. My agent deals with contracts and negotiations every day as part of her job. This is something she does day in and day out. She knows what she's talking about. She knows how it works. She knows what the red flags are. And so she went through the document, raised all the things that were of concern and told me about it. None of this was done behind my back. None of it was done without my knowledge. She raised the points, we talked it through, explained to things that when I've read it, I didn't understand some of the legalese. She said, okay, this means this and this is how it works. and this is quite common, this is industry standard, and she talks it all through. Any things that I have a problem with, she can add it to the list and raise it with the publisher. She'll tell me what's being changed, how it's negotiated, and this sort of thing. So nothing is done without your permission. Nothing is done without your awareness. I trusted my agent because she does contracts every day, but some people have then hired their own legal person to go through it, and you take that contract again, to your agent and they will then present it to the publisher and they will then negotiate it back and forth and come back to you. So you're always involved, you're always made aware until the final contract is signed, nothing is done without your permission or full awareness. So those are just some of the questions I've had on the community tab about working with a literary agent. If you've got any other general questions about traditional publishing or rights or agents or stuff like that, post it on there and I'll do a roundup usually about once a month. But that's it for tonight. I'll be back soon next week with another video.